I want to speak to you on a subject that I believe is absolutely misunderstood and misused in a lot of churches. And I'm going to talk to you about something very general from the Word of God. If I were to get very pacific, we could spend an awful lot of time because this is a subject that ranges from Genesis to Revelation. There isn't anywhere in the Word of God you cannot go and run into it. And so as a consequence, we're going to look at a lot of Scriptures. But I hope God will say something to you about this subject this morning. I've always been pretty keen on this business of first mention. Every time God mentions something for the first time, He lays down the pattern and the perimeters that are going to be followed through the rest of the Word of God. It isn't going to change. It isn't going to jump the track. It isn't going to become something new. And in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, the Word of God says this, And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Noah builded an altar. The altar of Noah, in its first mention, in Genesis 8 and verse 20, is an altar of grace. For the Bible says, And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then if you travel through the Scripture to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 7, there the Word of God says, And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous, are thy judgments. The last altar in the Bible is an altar of judgment. So I would say to you very simply this morning, the conclusion we can draw is this. What God begins in grace, He will end in judgment. And you and I need to realize that our God is a gracious, sovereign, saving God who will take mankind to the place of absolute judgment and the nations of the world will be turned into hell at the judgment of God. So we need to pay attention, I believe, to what God says about the altar. And that literally is the subject that I want you to follow with me in the Word of God this morning. In the book of Genesis, there are eight altars that are built. And those eight altars built in the book of Genesis began to set a pattern for us for the remainder of the Word of God. In chapter 8 and verse 20, as we read a moment ago, Noah built an altar unto God. But when we get to chapter 12, there we see Abraham. And in verse 7 of chapter 12, Noah builds an altar. In verse 8 of chapter 12, he builds another altar. In chapter 13 and verse 18, he builds a third altar. And then in chapter 22 and verse 9, he builds a fourth altar. Those four altars of Abraham will show us a pattern for life and living. 12.7 is an altar of surrender. He was going to obey God and go where God told him to go. In chapter 12 and verse 8, it is an altar of salvation, for there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. In chapter 13, you find the altars mentioned twice. It's mentioned in verse 4. But that's not a built altar, that's an altar to which he returned 
after he got out of the will of God and after he got to the place where he was living in a land and he didn't even hear the voice of God. He finally came back and he got things squared away. Then you go down to chapter 22 and verse 9. There is an altar of sacrifice and ultimate absolute surrender to the will of God. When he offered Isaac there unto God. The third man in Genesis that built an altar was Isaac. Chapter 26 and verse 25. And Isaac's altar is very unique because Isaac is one of the greatest types of the Lord Jesus to be found in all the Word of God. You notice he only builds one altar. Jesus Christ went to one cross. He died once for all. He will not be crucified a second time by anyone. He did the work complete and perfect in one. But you look at Isaac and you look at Rebekah and you look at the servant, the picture of the Holy Spirit gathering the bride and bringing her to the Son of God. And in that, we see Christ's fulfillment of his desire for you and for me. Not only was Isaac an altar builder, but so was Jacob. And over yonder in chapter 33 and verse 20, he built one to the mighty God of Israel. Also in chapter 35 at verse 7, he builds another altar. But what about others? There were a gang of people that built altars. There's Moses in Exodus 17. There's Joshua in Joshua chapter 8. There's Gideon in Judges 6 and 24. There is Samuel in 1 Samuel. There is David in 2 Samuel. There is Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 9. There's Uriah in 2 Kings 16 and 11. Step back for a moment. There are three groups of people that built altars in the Word of God. You know who they are? They're prophets. They're priests. And they're kings. And as to the prophet, priest, and king of all eternity, our Lord Jesus Christ offered himself once forever for the sacrifice of our sin. And yet, in type, all three of these built altars, but nobody built an altar like Jesus did. And thus our son, Savior and thus the Son of God becomes the perfect prophet and priest and king. Whether it is Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers, those books are absolutely filled with references to the altar of God. Yet the New Testament as well as the Old make reference to the altar. They were important then. They're still important today. I want you to open your Bible to my text this morning. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 10. I want to say to you this morning that there are three reasons that we dislike the altar today. I'm going to give them to you in a moment, but let's read verse 10. You go back to verse 8, Paul says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. Paul said, we have an altar. We have an altar. 
Now the reason we dislike the altar today is number one, the altar reveals our weakness. That has to do with pride. That has to do with the flesh. I have seen a lot in recent times of people who literally beat on people to come to the altar because they want to embellish their flesh and they want to embellish their profession and they want everybody to look and say well what a great preacher am I look how many people came to the altar I can tell you with all certainty I don't care if anybody ever comes to the altar you know why I don't care it's not about me it's about him and when God speaks and God moves and God draws people will do what God would have them to do but people today dislike the altar because it shows our weakness it shows our pride it shows our giving of ourselves to the flesh the second reason people don't like the altar today is our worldliness that worldliness literally is perverseness it's the perverseness of the mind giving ourselves over to the things of this age you say you're Christians this morning you say you love God this morning how many of you brought your idol to church with you this morning I'm just waiting for it to ring you know what? People don't think they can live without their telephone. They don't think they can live without that little computer in their hand and their heart. You know what's wrong? You've adopted the mindset of this world. You've adopted the things of the world and you don't have time for the things of God. You just let that little thing go off and see where you bow. I mean, that's just the way it is. We need to come to the place and I've, I've tried to do this for years. I got a phone. It ain't wrong to have a phone. It ain't wrong to use a phone. But my friend, it's wrong to let that thing get between you and God. Because then it becomes an idol. So when you pull into the parking lot of the house of God, throw that thing in the ashtray. That's what that's for, not your cigarette butts. Throw that telephone in there and come into the house of God and intend to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Intend to yield your heart to God and pay attention to the things of God. The third reason we don't like the altar is our wickedness. I mean, we get sin in our life and it's the pollution of this world and it affects our heart because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all who can know it and until God gives you a new heart and God gives you a new desire to love him your mind will never be changed and your flesh will certainly stay in the filth that it is in but when Jesus saves you the Bible said if any man be in Christ he's a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things are become new no wonder Paul said we have an altar we have an altar that's a place to deal with our weakness that's a place to deal with our worldliness that's a place to deal with our wickedness we have an altar may I submit to you there are three things that God does at his altar number one it's at the altar God might speak to us. I want you to think for a moment about who God talks to at the altar. Thank God for this dear soul that was saved last Wednesday night. I've had a jail ministry for some 22 years now. I'm director of chaplains at the Brown County Sheriff's Office. We deal not only with the officers and the corrections workers and their families but we have right now about five services a week inside the walls of that jail 
We'd been out of there for almost a year and a half. And about seven or eight weeks ago, we got to go back into the jail. And since we've been in the jail, we've seen nine professions of faith in Jesus Christ. And we've seen about a half a dozen, dozen others come telling us, I was saved. I trusted Jesus, but I let my life get off track and I got into the world and the flesh and the devil got in my life and I've lived in sin and that's why I'm here. And I'll tell you what, it's good to see God speaking to sinners. It's good to see God dealing with the hearts of men and women that they might find His love in conviction. They might find His love in conversion. They might find His love in something a lot of Christians miss today. You remember the word consecration? That's a word you don't hear much of today. How long has it been since as a child of God you looked at your life and said, I have consecrated myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is mine. I am His. I'm going to live for Him. I'm going to walk with Him. I'm going to serve Him. I'm going to be a witness of His mercy and love to this lost and dying world in which I live. You see, at the altar, God might speak to a sinner. And that sinner will get saved. And that sinner will yield themselves to God. And God will use them in a mighty and a marvelous way. You pointed out earlier today that someone in here, oh, there she is, I wondered what happened to you. Uh, you know Brother Bill. You know his influence. I had something happen to me last Sunday. They had a graduation party for my grandson. And it was a combination graduation party and birthday party. He was born on my wife and I's anniversary which was just last Wednesday. God's given us 59 years together. And we thank Him and praise Him for that. But we went to this graduation birthday party. And uh, I walk over to a table to talk to a man that I know. We're standing there talking. And he introduces me to this lady. And she smiles at me. And I wouldn't have known her from a stop sign. You know, I mean... I, I can't remember her. I don't think I've ever seen her. And then he tells me something. He said, when she was six years old, you took her to youth camp down at Camp Ruggles. Did you ever go to Ruggles with us? One time. Do you remember what Ruggles is? It's an old Billy Sunday campground. That tabernacle at Camp Ruggles up there in eastern Kentucky it was built in the 1800s for Billy Sunday's preaching revivals. And we took kids down there by the bus load. And we'd have our own camp down there. And um, this lady, when she was six years old, went to camp with us. And she lives in Dayton, Ohio now, and she's a member of a Baptist church, and she serves the Lord. Amen. You look back and you think about that. How sweet and how precious it is to see that there was a day and time and there was a place when people got on their faces before God at an altar and God spoke to sinners and saved them by His grace and by His mercy. But you know, God not only speaks to sinners at the altar, He speaks to His sons. The sons and daughters of God at the altar feel His leading, they know His discipline. And it's there they learn to obey His voice. Amen. Now, Brother Doug was telling you about playing volleyball. You know what the problem with, with that uh, dodgeball they wanted to play in the gym? Some of them boys wanted to use bowling balls. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't want to use soccer balls or basketballs. They wanted to use bowling balls. They wanted to see hair, eyes, and teeth all over the concrete. <laughs> Every time they threw one of them balls at somebody. Them boys was mean. <laughs> they, uh, I mean, I guess they just grew up that way out there in the country. But at any rate, during those days, there was times and places when we saw God begin to work in the hearts and lives of young men and young women. And we saw God begin to deal with them and shape their lives in a way that 
one day we knew and felt that God would call them into his service. Know what a joy and blessing it is to know that God's still calling people to serve him. But not only does God speak to sinners and to sons, but he also speaks to the saints. And beloved, it's there they find full peace when they feel his presence. Do you know what it is to get with God? To get on your face with God and let Him wrap His arms around you. Let Him pour His love out upon you. Let Him take the tears that are breaking your heart and begin to wipe away those tears from your eyes. Oh, my friend, it's at the altar that the saints find His presence. But it's also at the altar the servants find His power. You'll never be the witness for God He would have you to be Amen. unless you have His power in your life. Right. Right. It's not by power and might, God said, but it's by my Spirit, yes. saith yes. the Lord. Yes. And when a child of God comes to that place where they've yielded themselves as a servant unto the Lord, and they have God's power upon them, then their lives are going to touch other lives. We're going to win other people to Jesus Christ. Now, I've wrestled with this for 61 years. I absolutely despise the word soul winner. I don't win nothing. You said it. We don't win nothing. No, we're just the messengers. That's all in the world we do. We just carry the baggage. And we take it out there and lay it out for them. And, and we take out what the Lord has prepared and given and we set it on the table and we hope they'll partake of it. We don't win nobody to nothing. But all we do is try to live before them and witness before them so that they can see Christ in us, the hope of glory. And God wants Sunday school teachers. He wants people to work on buses. and God wants people to go out and knock on doors. But my dear friend, until... You know his power. God cannot use you. God cannot bless you like he wants to. But then there's a second thing God might do at his altar. There God might reveal that there's something between you and somebody else. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, at verse 23, the Bible says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. In Matthew it said this way, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him, his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Let me tell you something about Christians. We can get very clannish and very clicky sometimes. And we can let somebody offend us. And you know how we react? We look at them and say, Till that lousy so-and-so comes and apologizes to me, I ain't going to have nothing to do with him. I mean, if he's standing on the street corner on fire, I wouldn't spit on him. You know. No, he's going to have to come, or she's going to have to come, and they're going to have to beg for my forgiveness. You only got one problem. You see, when we're not right with others, we're not right with God. And when we're not right with God then we got the problem. Did you notice what Matthew 18 said? Matthew 18 said, It moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. God said it's up to you to go. It's not up to them to come. If you're offended and you're aggravated with somebody, it's not their responsibility to come around to you and beg you 
to forgive them. It's your responsibility to go to them and to talk it over with them and to get that thing straightened out. And you see, that's the sad thing today. Oh no, they did that to me. They're going to have to be the ones to make the first step. Several years ago, I had a man do something to me that hurt me like few things have ever hurt me. We'd served God together for 33 years. And he turned on me in a way I felt like I'd been bit with a bulldog. And after I left Williamsburg, I began to think about those things. And I came to the place where I just said in my heart, Lord, help me to forgive him. Help me to just put this thing aside and let it go. It ain't doing me no good. It sure ain't doing him no good. And it was a while before we encountered one another. But when we did encounter another, one another, one of the first things he said was, can you forgive me? And I said, no, don't have to. I already have. Amen. And I can tell you today, he and I share a ministry together today. Amen. You see what God can do if we'll do it God's way? Yeah. And when we get something between us and somebody else, it's our responsibility to get that thing right and to get it forgiven. And so many of God's people never get right one with another because they never come to God's altar to get right with Him. There's a word of caution and warning in the Bible. Proverbs 18, 19. If a brother, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. It's not easy, but it's right. Don't let pride, don't let vindictiveness cause you to run at others. Get things right and keep them right before God. Then there's a third thing that happens at the altar. God might speak to us as sinners, as sons, as saints and servants. God might reveal something between ourselves and others. But God also might manifest His glory. I want you to go back in your Bibles with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter number 9. Leviticus, chapter number 9. I want you to see something here. I like to start in verse 1. And it came to pass on the eighth day. Oh, you know what the eighth day is? That's the first day. That's the first day of the week. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. First day. Man, it's the day to be in the house of God. It's the day to sing the praises of God. You know, I've been a lot of places here lately. You're to be commended. I haven't seen a choir and heard a choir like that in years. You know, most churches today can't even get a praise group up there. And of course, a praise group, there ought to be an open season on them. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, if you really want to know how I feel, I'll tell you. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I have never seen such debauchery and butchery to the old songs of Zion as I'm seeing in our world today. I didn't think you could mess up Amazing Grace, but I've seen Amazing Grace drug through the mud. I didn't think you could mess up just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. I can, make, I can show you a couple of samples of that that you'll never want to sing that again after you hear them. It's pathetic what people are doing to the music of the church. Brother Doug's right. If it don't have a melody and a message that speaks to your heart, you need to put it somewhere else. It needs, it needs, we need something that will deal with this. Get us where we ought to be before God. Well, the second thing in Leviticus is in verse 7. 
And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar. Whoops. God didn't say anything to Aaron about if you feel like it or it happens to be convenient for you. No, what God's saying to us is, and, and I don't believe in this running to the altar at every song, every invitation and that stuff. I think people that run to the altar every invitation have got probably two problems. Number one is they may never have been saved. And number two, they're living in so much sin, I don't see how they get to church from Saturday to Sunday. You know, but listen, when there is a need, when God does speak and God does deal, man, don't back off. You need to go to the altar. And that's exactly what he's telling Aaron. You've got business to do with God. And when you get to the altar, you can do that business with God. Then if you will, look on down just a little bit. Notice if you will, again here in this particular passage of Scripture, that God is speaking. And it says, And the sons of Aaron brought the blood, brought the blood unto him and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar and poured it out at the bottom of the altar he not only came to the altar he did something when he got there he did what God wanted done look at verse 16 and he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to the manner at the altar Spiritual problems are solved. At the altar, the saints of God find peace. At the altar, the servants of God find power. No wonder Paul said, but we have an altar. The altar is where God meets and deals with the needs of his children and the needs of the lost. But I would say one other thing to you. If saved people don't use the altar of God, why do you ever think a lost person will? Lost people need to see God's people using the altar in a godly way to glorify the Lord Jesus. The first altar of the Bible is an altar of grace. The last altar of the Bible is an altar of judgment. If you're a Christian today, How's your relationship with Jesus Christ? If you're a Christian today, do you know what it is to be right with God? Do you know what it is to be clean in the sight of God? Do you know what it is to be caring in the sight of God? Do you know what it is to be consecrated in the sight of God? If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible tells us, He that cometh unto me, him I will in no wise cast out. He is a Savior of sinners, and he'll save you today. But if you are saved, do you know what it is to have a real relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Do you know what it is to be right and to be yielded to serve him? The altar of the Bible is an altar where these things are accomplished. Our Heavenly Father, in the precious name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for the goodness of your grace. And Lord, as Brother Doug comes to continue this invitation, Father, whatever it is in the lives and hearts of your children that needed to be addressed, Lord, I pray this message may have addressed it. But Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit may even take things unsaid and use them to bring deep and abiding conviction. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being with the family of Emmanuel Baptist Church today. Thank you for Brother Doug and his life and his ministry and his family. And Lord, we just ask your richest blessings to be poured out upon them. But Lord, most of all, we thank you for Calvary. We thank you for that blood that Jesus shed for our sins. And Father, we thank you that we can have the hope and the promise of heaven burning in our souls as we do this day. Lord, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Doug.
us all stand, Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. Dear Christian friend, when's the Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.